I know we'll have to use the buttons. <clears throat> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, you see my title page, and please pay attention to the disclaimer down at the bottom. I have to uh, indicate that I am not speaking here with the permission or express approval of the uh, executive, uh, executive Committee of the Ventana Chapter of the Sierra Club or the Marina Planning <laughs> Commission or Sierra Club California or the United States Naval War College or the U.S. government, all right? So <laughs> these opinions are solely my own. And they're intended to help you think about a very challenging base reuse process that is now in, depending on how you want to count, its uh, 20th year or its 18th year of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Um, so I want to challenge you to think about this. And uh, as with any sort of public uh, discussion of this nature, if you disagree with uh, some of my opinions, I'd like to hear about it because by those sorts of public discussions, I think we arrive at better uh, public policy and public decisions. So I want to start. Actually, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to introduce, uh, interrupt you, Tom. We will have plenty of time for question and answers at the end. I'm sorry I didn't explain the process. All three presenters are going to speak for about 15 minutes each, and then that'll leave plenty of time for Q&A, and I hope a lot of people have questions for the panelists. So I'd like to give you a little bit of kind of interesting history uh, that I think bears on the base reuse process. It'll take me a little while to connect that up. Um, you may recall that back in 1948, President Truman desegregated the U.S. military in the wake of World War II. And the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy turned out to be at the forefront of desegregation in the United States. Um, that being said, on July 27th, 1948, Monterey Peninsula communities were still effectively segregated. Um, by 1964, the Civil Rights Act uh, had ended legalized segregation nationwide. It, for example, had made those uh, deed restrictions on most of the properties that you can still find today. If you look far enough back in county records, those properties in Pacific Grove, which prohibit the sale of those properties to people of color, people of the Ottoman Empire, Jews, etc., etc. Um, those, of course, were made illegal by the 1964 Act. So by 1980, this is what the composition looked like on the peninsula cities. Kind of interesting rank order. And obviously, Seaside and Marina were fairly heavily not Caucasian. In fact, one might argue that this was a consequence of those two communities being right adjacent to the former Fort Ord, which had desegregated uh, some 20 or so years earlier. Um, and this is just a little bit of theory, but we may see later that it's kind of borne out. Uh, much of the minority population in Seaside was black. Um, it seems as though much of the minority population in Marina was fairly mixed, but you may recall that we've deployed uh, soldiers overseas for many, many years, and sometimes those gentlemen go overseas and meet someone and fall in love and bring their wife back to the States, and you have a biracial marriage. Nothing absolutely wrong with that, but where do you go to live? And it seems that a lot of those folks chose Marina because Marina today is a very, very diverse community with uh, heavy uh, representation from a lot of the nations where we have sent soldiers in the past. Okay, so um, more to the point of the former Fort Ord. January 1990, rumors start circulating. A friend of mine who was working as an intern in the office of the Secretary of Defense said, oh boy, Tom, you better watch out. Better sell your property in Marina because they're probably going to close the base. Sure enough, about a year, a little less than a year and a half later, Department of Defense confirmed the decision to close the former Fort Ord, and a few months after that, President Bush accepted that closure list with no changes, despite all of the attempts at political intervention from local uh, politicians, our local congressman, someone by the name of Leon Panetta, made some valiant efforts to uh, prevent that from happening. Well, so here we come to optimistic expectation number one. This was testimony before Congress by a Bush administration official specifically about the closure of Fort Ord. 
Well, with the price of real estate in Monterey, we can sell off all 28,000 acres and pay off the national debt. I see you agree that this is an optimistic expectation. And it didn't take into account contaminated groundwater, 7,000 acres of unexploded ordnance, tons of lead, copper, and whatever else gets put in a bullet in the dunes west of Highway 1, lead paint and asbestos uh, in a variety of buildings around the base. Optimistic expectation number two, we can clean the place up in 20 years for a mere $60 million. Uh, I point out that we're about 20 years down the line and it looks like we have 15 or 20 more to go. Um, unintended consequence number one. Here's what folks who had been to a certain extent on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder, living in Marina and Seaside for the most part, uh, whose cities in the wake of Proposition 13 weren't sitting on the nicest tourist attractive uh, terrain or features. And in the wake of Proposition 13, how does a city today increase revenues? Well, you look for the next increment of transient occupancy tax. How do you get that? Build hotels. What do you need to build hotels? Some attractive feature to build the hotels near. Uh, you increase sales tax revenue. How do you do that? You build the next shopping center. Okay, so. We've got seven cities competing with one another, several of whom sit on the nicer features and have been around longer than Marina and Seaside. So surprise, surprise, those cities historically, and in particular leading up to 1991, were doing a good bit better than Marina and Seaside. I recall seeing uh, Monterey city budgets getting close to 10 times the size of Marina city budgets for populations that were not 10 times apart. Um, so here's our chance. I was on the Planning Commission at this time. I participated in some of these visioning sessions that were convened both by Marina and Seaside. Think about what are we going to do with all this property we're going to get on the former Fort Ord because indeed some years earlier the federal government had acceded to allowing those cities to extend their city boundaries onto the former Fort Ord so that folks who came to Fort Ord and lived on the base and took out a California driver's license or a registered their car in California, those tax revenues that the city got a piece of would go to those cities. Didn't cost the government, federal government, anything to do that. So now we arrive in 1991 and those boundaries have been extended and Seaside and Marina have dominion over that property. So we're going to catch up. We're going to we're going to show those folks who've been looking down their socioeconomic noses at us for so many years, and we're going to, huzzah, we're going to do some really great things. So, for instance, we're going to put a submarine base in Marina, <laughs> a zoo, uh, Marine World. Um, we'll get the Smithsonian Institution to build Smithsonian West. Um, we're going to take a festival plaza so that we can host the say the county fair, I mean, why don't we just take it away from the county fairgrounds in Monterey? They wouldn't object in any way to that. Um, and the one I really like were the, uh, the wharfs out into the bay from Marina on that eroding coastline. Uh, and finally, Disneyland. Disney had gone from Anaheim with its first park 3,000 miles east to its second park 5,000 miles east to its third park 6,000 miles east to its fourth park and now it was going to go 300 miles north and compete with itself. <laughs> okay, these were scary visions. Coast Weekly interviewed Charles McNeely, the uh, general manager, or the city manager for the city of Seaside and he pointed out this Little fact at the time, notice the underlying, underlying section. Hey, it's our turf. State of California said we're a city. Our boundaries are recognized. We control land use jurisdictions there and there's nothing you can do about it. Hmm. Coast Weekly, furthermore, um, acknowledging there was some fear on the part of some of the other peninsula cities um, a kind of possible fear about the economics of it all. Well, if you're going to take the fairgrounds away, I can understand Monterey being a little unhappy about that. 
If you're going to build a whole lot of hotels west of Highway 1, 15 story hotels along the beach, turn this into a Miami Beach looking place, I can understand why other folks elsewhere on the peninsula might be a little concerned. Um, there were allegations, maybe this all had to do with racial issues given the different racial composition of Marina and Seaside. Um, but here's what, interestingly enough, whether you like him or hate him, Lance McClare had an interesting response. This isn't about racism. This is class warfare. Hmm, okay. More reactions. Well, our Congressman Leon Panetta had convey, convened a panel, a task force involving representation across the community, and that began to exhibit some friction with Seaside and Marina not exactly playing ball. And here was an interesting uh, editorial in the Herald of December 1st, 1991. Seaside has a siege mentality, a seaside first attitude that puts it constantly at odds with its neighbors. Okay, I could perhaps see that opinion if you're a city councilman in Pacific Grove or Monterey, but what if you're a city councilman in Seaside? You know, you might say the very same thing about those cities having put themselves first for all of these years and Seaside second. So, um, so here's unintended consequence number two. Senate Bill 710 introduced by Senator Henry Mello because cities are creatures of the state legislature and what the state legislature create, the state legislature can take away. And indeed, SB 710 does that. Note that it was taken to the legislature at the request of Monterey County and the cities you see listed in red was not requested by Seaside or Marina. Um, and basically it clipped the wings of Seaside and Marina with respect to their sovereign land use powers. It limited them. Um, it also said things along the lines, and I'm sure uh, Mayor Delgado may have something to say about the underlying sections on the bottom paragraph, that uh, FORA that does receive property from the Army uh, is supposed to, within a reasonable period of time, transfer that to the underlying land use jurisdiction uh, at no cost. Think about that. So. Let's talk about this enabling legislation written so many years ago by the state legislature. Um, it did establish this precedent, and this is an interesting precedent. And it's a little surprising that the state legislators went along with this because what is done to Marina and Seaside here on the Monterey Peninsula, now that you've established that the state legislature can do that, could be done to some other city elsewhere. Maybe, say, a group of legislators from cities in Northern California are tired of sending so much water to Southern California, so how about we clip LA County and Los Angeles's land use jurisdiction so they stop taking water from us? Hmm? They haven't gone there yet. Um, part of the structure of the board puts four of 13 votes on that board that have no land at Fort Ord. So there's an argument that they have a much smaller dog in the fight if they have a dog in the fight at all. Two more of those votes have land use jurisdiction over less than 2% of the former Fort Ord. So six of 13 votes, almost a majority, have less than 2% interest in the land of the former Fort Ord. For whether you think that's good or bad, that's the way the Enabling Act structured this. And in addition, whether you think this is good or bad, there are a variety of large landowners that are other government agencies, some state and some federal, that have no vote on the Fort Ord Reuse Authority at all. A um, few other things that were missing. Although the state said, FORA will give you 20 years to do your job, you will sunset on June 30th, 2014, we're not going to require you to have a termination or transition plan. All we're going to say is, when you get done, Tell LAFCO and LAFCO will figure out what to do. Okay. Um, it gave them the power to take some revenues from the cities and spend it elsewhere on the former Fort Ord, which has obviously become a issue, a controversial issue. 
Um, for a board was not prevented from making commitments beyond its sunset date, even if you could reasonably predict making a commitment in, say, 2009, and you weren't going to be able to finish it by 2014, you could still go ahead and do that. And one could argue that the for a board did do that. Um, one of the other, what I view as a flaw in the Enabling Act, is the fact that FORA was sold as a regional planning agency, but it never really was given full powers as a regional planning agency. In particular, its main power was limited to consistency determinations of the plans of the underlying cities. So in 1997, basically three years after FORA was created, they came up with a base reuse plan. And it's a lengthy plan. Uh, it fits on a CD, but you know how many pages can go on a CD. Uh, so this is just some statistics, if you will, from that plan. Uh, CSUMB, one of the more successful creations on the former Fort Ord, that institution, was planned for 25,000 students in the plan, 8,000 dorm rooms. Uh, my understanding is they've ratcheted back that plan for 25,000 students a good bit, and if you are paying attention to the media, you know that most of the institutions of higher education in this state are experiencing some budgetary issues right at the moment. Um, the Ord military community, so although we call this the closure of the former Fort Ord, it was actually a substantial reduction in size. Um, and finally, a whole lot of dwelling units. Okay. So, unintended consequence of some of the size and scope of that base reuse plan was that the Sierra Club sued Fora over it. The lawsuit was settled out of court. About a year later, it capped housing at 6,000 housing units until January 2013, and it capped water use at 6,600 acre feet, which happens to be exactly the amount of groundwater that the Ord community is allowed to take from the Salinas Valley groundwater basin. It required some permanent deed restrictions on all FORA property. Um, it is interesting to note, however, that FORA basically exercises its powers only a, over about 6,200 acres of the almost 28,000 acres, and that's because some of it's retained by the Army, much of it went to the Bureau of Land Management, etc. cetera. Um, here were some other interesting optimistic expectations of decision makers along the line. We're not going to have another housing downturn, at least not in our lifetime. Mm, how'd that work out for us? Um, we can entitle nearly 6,000 dwelling units, mostly single-family homes, and not have an economic impact on the local housing market. Okay, so my assertion here is that this has resulted in almost a virtual standstill of the problem. Uh, of the reuse and redevelopment of the base. Um, where do I get some of these figures? Seaside Highlands was the last major housing subdivision other than what the military has been building, uh, but that's not for public sale. Um, they built 379 homes, sold them out in 24 months. That's about 190 homes on average. Uh, their consistency was not determined by FORA because this was a sale from the Army to, I believe, Seaside or the developer, I'm not sure which. So they escaped play, paying capacity charges to Marina Coast Water District and certain charges to FORA. Um, so here's the total in all these developments. Now, you may want to criticize Marina Station being up there because Marina Station is not on the former Fort Ord. It's in the city of Marina on the north end of Marina. However, when you entitle 1,360 homes right next to Marina, that's going to have some kind of interaction and impact on the rest of these existing entitlements. Now, in addition to those entitlements, I understand there's some proposed projects out there that could be another 2,600 or more units. Um, and there's a few ideas, I guess, floating around that haven't even made it to uh, that list. So five, let's just look at what's entitled. At 190 houses per year, by the way, Seaside Highland sold at the height of the real estate market, not at the rate the real estate market is selling today, but let's be optimistic and say that market will come back tomorrow. At 190 houses a year, it'll only take us 31.3 years to sell out those 
59, 54 houses. Um, I do have to ask this question though. Anybody know how many have been built since the last Seaside Highlands house was sold about six years ago? These are for sale. There's been one built, none sold. It was the model over at Seaside. So we're not moving forward very quickly. Oh, has the model sold? Yeah, sold. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Progress. So I do have this question. Of these 5964 homes, how many can be sold to people who don't need a job? Hmm. Probably not so many. So what's the job situation? That was the plan. Build out 3,200 jobs at CSU Monterey Bay, although I suspect that's been ratcheted back with the decrease in the number of students. Um, 500 acres planned for a research and industrial center along Reservation Road. And certainly you'd want to select a developer for that who has a history, has national capability in bringing in jobs. I know, let's pick UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, they've been on the job for 14 years now. Mm, haven't brought in more than about 100 jobs. Um, I think probably we ought to do something about that. So here's my prediction. If we stick with our dreams, if we stick with the current plan, we're going to see this base reuse stretching out 50 or more years. We're going to watch old World War II era buildings rot into the ground for another 20 years or more. Um, and we'll get to about 2022, and the Fort Ord Reuse Authority will need another 10-year extension. Um, and in the meantime, millions of dollars will have been wasted on infrastructure that's not yet needed because progress hasn't happened on the plan. Think the extension of General Jim Moore Boulevard. That's absolutely necessary, right, to move around traffic today. I don't think so. So let me bring it back finally to what I opened with, and that's what these communities look like. At least the good thing is we have desegregated the Monterey Peninsula. <laughs> oh, well, okay, maybe not. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you will think about some of these ideas. Thank you. Okay, next Christy Markey is going to present. Um, Tom really did a great introduction into what Christy is going to talk about. Um, and the other thing I'd like, I'd like to just note, um, Tom mentioned the 5,900 homes that have been entitled in the former Fort Ord. Um, I just always have to say, you know, that doesn't account for the other uh, 5,000 or so houses throughout Monterey County that have been entitled and not yet built. So currently there's about 10,000 800 homes throughout Monterey County, most of which focused in the former Fort Ord, that can build tomorrow if they so desire. They're entitled, but just waiting for the economy to come back, it's always something I like to keep in mind and 